Good evening. And thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Stanford Hospitals and Clinics COVID-19 Update and Transplantation, the Management of End-Stage Renal Disease and End-Stage Liver Disease. Allow me, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Tammy Doherty. I'm a transplant hepatologist here at Stanford, and I'm the course director for this webinar. Next slide, please. I have with me today um, Joanna Nelson. She is the Clinical Assistant Professor in Medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease. Dr. Ajaz Ahmed, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and also a transplant hepatologist. And Dr. Ade Taiwo, Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Nephro Nephrology and a transplant nephrologist. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Next slide. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for today's live stream. On the slide, there's a screenshot of the Zoom webinar window. Please um, pay attention to the bottom black panel of the image. Um, as you can see, there are three options for you to communicate with us. Chat, raise your hand, or Q&A. The chat box will be the main mechanism for you to communicate with the hosts, our CME staff, or should any technical issues arise or if you need assistance troubleshooting. Additionally, if that doesn't work, you can email stanfordcme at stanford.edu for any additional tech support. Next slide. Oh, <laughs> sorry, back the slide. Um, as you can see, the chat box will pop up in the center of your screen. So during the talk, you can submit um, your questions and answers in the QA section. Um, and that'll be your main mechanism for asking questions of our speakers. Um, you can keep that box open and have that um, to the side so that way it's not in the middle of the live stream. Um, you can submit questions throughout the live stream and we will respond to you either directly to that question or we'll respond that we'll address that at the end of the session. Next slide. This slide has information on the post-webinar certification and how you can claim your CME credits. Uh, the host will make this information available for you in the chat. Additionally, all of our faculty um, have no nothing to disclose in relation to this webinar today. So those are all of our housekeeping announcements. So without further ado, let's begin our program. Good evening, I am Tammy Doherty, and I again would like to welcome you to Stanford Hospital and Clinic's COVID-19 update in transplantation. The purpose of this webinar is to provide an up-to-date information on the COVID-19 pandemic and how it affects our liver and kidney transplant patients. It will review the virology, testing and treatment recommendations, and the current state of vaccination trials. It will describe how Stanford Hospital and Clinics is able to provide ongoing specialty transplant care. The structure of this talk will be as follows. An introduction describing the current rate of infections and deaths due to COVID-19 worldwide and in the US. It, we will then describe the current practice guidelines implemented at S Stanford Hospital and Clinics to maintain the liver and kidney transplant programs. Dr. Joanna Nelson will then discuss the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of COVID-19, followed by Dr. A. Jazz Ahmeds and Dr. Ade Taiwo. With a question and answer session. In late December of 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases were reported in the Wuhan province of China. Within a short period of time, China was able to sequence this novel coronavirus, and it was dubbed COVID-19. Over the ensuing months, this virus began to spread worldwide, such that by mid-March, the WHO classified COVID-19 as a global pandemic. To date, it has spread to over 188 countries and regions, 
and there are over 30 million cases confirmed worldwide, resulting in over 946,000 deaths. Courtesy of the COVID-19 dashboard from Johns Hopkins University, we can see the cumulative cases worldwide on this map. Furthermore, within the US, as depicted on this map, there have been 6.67 million cases re report resulting in 197,000 deaths. If we look further into California, there have been 775,000 cases resulting in 14,000 deaths. In the lower edge of this slide, this graph shows the cumulative COVID cases by county in and around the San Francisco area, extending down to Fresno. As you can see, in April, there did appear to be a flattening of the curve. This is likely reflective of the shelter in place requirements mandated by Bay Area counties in mid-March. However, in the beginning of mid-June and early July, it does appear that there has been an increase in the cases, and this may correspond to um, the fact that several Bay Area counties were actually allowing the opening of personal care services. This virus affects all ages. It can affect all organ systems and is highly communicable. Symptoms can range from organ failure and death to asymptomatic carriers. We now have highly sensitive and specific testing kits and protocols and shelter in place and the proper use of masks and PPE has slowed down the transmission. However, we want to assess the effect of this virus has had on patient care and in particular, our liver and kidney transplant candidates and recipients. During this time, Stanford has maintained an active liver and kidney transplant program. Additionally, we continue to offer complete care and transplant evaluations by using a combination of video platforms and in-person visits. This allows us to minimize potential patient exposure to the virus while upholding shelter in place county recommendations. Additionally, it allows more family members and friends to be able to participate in the transplant evaluation process. One of the ways that we are able to complete the transplant evaluations and deliver state-of-the-art care is by utilizing COVID-19 testing for all surgeries and invasive procedures, including colonoscopies, upper endoscopies, and liver cancer treatments, for example. Additionally, all patients presenting to the emergency department or transferred in from an outside hospital undergo COVID testing and screening, thereby decreasing the risk, the exposure risk, not only to our patients, but to our healthcare and hospital workers. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Joanna Nelson from our infectious diseases department. Hi, my name is Joanna Nelson. I'm one of the clinical faculty in the infectious disease division at Stanford. Today I'm going to be talking about some basics of SARS-CoV-2, including diagnostics, who should get tested, treatment and prevention, all in the context of our current approach at Stanford. So SARS-CoV-2, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, is a novel RNA virus closely related to SARS-CoV. It preferentially infects cells in the respiratory tract, although the virus has been isolated from other organs in the body as well in autopsy studies. It is transmitted mostly through respiratory droplets. The estimated incubation period is up to 14 days with a median of four to five days. SARS-CoV-2 can cause asymptomatic infection and the exact number of these cases is unclear since testing has been limited. The majority of symptomatic patients will have mild symptoms, such as fever, fatigue, dry cough, myalgias, headache or sore throat, smell and taste disorders, or GI symptoms. About 20 to 30% of symptomatic patients develop shortness of breath and pneumonia, with a smaller proportion going on to develop ARDS. Mortality is about 
2 to 3 percent in a large cohort out of China. But this varies widely in different areas, mostly because it's often not clear how many people have the disease, since not all asymptomatic or mild cases are captured. The recommended test to diagnose COVID-19 is a real-time PCR of specimen collected by nasopharyngeal swab. This nucleic acid amplification test detects one or more gene sequences specific to SARS-CoV-2. There are a number of these tests that have gained emergency authorization for use under the FDA, including one developed independently by the lab at Stanford. The RT-PCR assay developed at Stanford has a sensitivity of 96% and specificity of 100%. This is a timeline of testing in comparison to symptom onset. You can see that the virus in the nasopharynx is detectable as, as early as day one of symptoms, and the viral load usually peaks within the first week. Virus can remain detectable in samples for two to three weeks, sometimes even longer, in severe cases, although we know now that this is not always infectious viable virus. And recent studies suggest viable virus usually is gone by 10 days in most patients, sometimes takes up to 20 days in immunocompromised patients. This chart also shows that lower tract respiratory samples from the BAL can remain positive later into the illness compared to nasopharyngeal samples. Serology detects antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in blood by ELISA or lateral flow assay. Antibodies in response to infection generally take days to weeks to develop, as you can see on this chart as evidenced by the dotted lines. In one study, the median time to development of IgM antibody was 12 days, and IgG antibody was 14 days. At seven days from symptom onset, less than 40% had detectable antibodies. But by 15 days from symptom onset, 94% had positive IgM and 80% had positive IgG. Because antibodies can take weeks to reliably develop, serology has a limited utility in diagnosing acute infection. The sensitivity and specificity of serology depend on the disease prevalence in the population. For example, in an area with low prevalence of disease, a positive IgG is more likely to represent a false positive than in an area with a high prevalence. An issue unique to the transplant population is that serology results may not be reliable due to the altered immune response. For all these reasons, serology is not recommended to make the diagnosis of COVID-19 at this time. Serology is currently most helpful for epidemiologic studies and ongoing surveillance. So who should be tested for COVID-19? Testing recommendations vary based on local testing availability. Our local county guidance suggests testing anyone with at least one consistent symptom of possible infection with COVID-19. Furthermore, asymptomatic patients should be tested if they've had a close contact to someone confirmed to have COVID-19, and a close contact is defined as somebody who's been within six feet for at least 15 minutes, or if they are frontline workers or healthcare workers. At Stanford, we're fortunate to have the ability to test widely. We are currently testing all admitted patients regardless of their presenting symptoms, as well as all patients before they undergo an invasive procedure. Recently, testing was opened up to all Stanford employees in concordance with county guidance. Over 11,000 of 14,000 employees were tested and only 0.3% of asymptomatic employees were positive with an overall positivity rate of 0.1%. We feel our aggressive testing strategy will be useful in protecting our workforce as well as our patients from SARS-CoV-2 infection. There are drive-through testing sites available to test outpatients throughout the Bay Area. Testing is ordered by a provider and PCR results are available within 24 hours. There are also more rapid tests with the results available within three hours for selected high-risk populations or those patients being admitted. You can see here the cumulative PCR testing that's been done by the Stanford lab. Over 140,000 tests for both Stanford patients and local testing done and sent to Stanford since the beginning of the pandemic. Of those tests done, the positivity rate is 3.6%. So changing gears and talking about treatment a little bit. The backbone of treatment in patients with COVID-19 really is supportive care. Treatment options can be divided into three broad categories, agents with antiviral properties that act directly on the virus, immunomodulating agents that aim to prevent or mitigate any damage that can be caused by the body's immune response to the virus, 
and lastly, by giving passive immunity, for example, through infusion of convalescent plasma or recombinant antibodies targeting SARS-CoV-2 virus. Clinical trials to date have shown good outcomes for the antiviral remdesivir and steroids as immunomodulators. These agents, therefore, have been adopted into treatment guidelines and have become standard of care. Further therapies are investigational at this point, and many agents are being studied in ongoing clinical trials. The NIH and IDSA recommend that any therapeutics beyond the standard of care be used in context of a clinical trial, which has been our goal at Stanford. So to talk a bit about um, the agents that I mentioned that probably have the best data to date. So first, remdesivir. Stanford is involved in the NAAID adaptive COVID-19 trial for which uh, results of the first arm of the trial have been released. This was a multi-center randomized control trial of over a thousand patients comparing remdesivir to placebo. In this trial, they found that the median time to recovery was 11 days in patients receiving remdesivir compared to 15 days in those who received placebo. There was, sorry, there was a trend toward decreased mortality in the remdesivir arm, this, but this was not statistically significant. Based on this trial, remdesivir obtained emergency use authorization by the FDA, can be obtained for treatment outside of a trial, and is considered standard of care for hospitalized patients for moderate to severe disease in which, to which we'll compare other therapies. In July, the results of the recovery trial were published. This was a multi-center randomized controlled trial done in the UK involving over 6,000 patients randomized to either standard of care or dexamethasone. Specifically, the 28-day mortality was 22.9% in the group of patients treated with steroids compared to 25.7% in those that did not receive steroids. Broken down, the benefit was greater for those patients who required supplemental O2 or mechanical ventilation at the time of enrollment. This study concluded that there was a significant mortality benefit in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 who were requiring oxygen treated with steroids. This has now, become, uh, this has now been adopted as standard of care for the management of hospitalized patients. We have several ongoing clinical trials at Stanford, including the NAAID Adaptive COVID-19 Treatment Trial, which I mentioned previously, which has now moved on to evaluate immunomodulators in combination with remdesivir. We are also evaluating the efficacy of a monoclonal antibody against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in a randomized control trial. There are several outpatient studies evaluating therapeutics for mild disease, and we'll also be involved in upcoming vaccine trials. Overall, this is really a rapidly evolving landscape and we are continually evaluating new agents for this virus. Our goal is really to continue to offer the best therapies available to patients infected with COVID-19. Of course, we are all anxiously awaiting the development of an effective vaccine. You can see the structure of the coronavirus particle at the top of this slide. The S or spiked protein is the major target for vaccine development. There are over 100 vaccines in development currently, with a few undergoing clinical trials, now currently nine in phase three trials. Preliminary data suggests some vaccines are safe, tolerable, and effectively induce neutralizing antibodies in specific T cell response. Timeline, timeline of an effective vaccine is unclear at this point, but this preliminary clinical data is promising. There are currently no effective prophylactic agents to take to protect a patient from contracting SARS-CoV-2. The best prevention involves social distancing to prevent the spread of infection. At Stanford, we continue to operate in the safest manner possible. Everyone at Stanford, everyone in a Stanford healthcare facility is required to wear a mask. Visitors are limited and screened. All employees have symptoms checked daily. All hospitalized patients with COVID-19 are sequestered in isolation units. As a result of these infection control practices, we are doing our part to prevent the spread of disease and create a safe environment for the care of our patients. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Nelson, for such an insightful talk. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm Ajaz Ahmed. I'm one of the transplant hepatologist, and uh, I will be covering liver transplantation um, 
during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just a little bit of an overview in, in this first slide. Um, uh, the top uh, green graph uh, or the line across the graph shows the number of adult transplants by week on a weekly basis across US. As you note here, there was a dip plummeting in the number of liver transplantation. In fact, all solid organ transplants, especially noted in the New York tri-state area. And um, if you look at uh, on the bottom, living donor liver transplantation and disease donor liver transplantation, disease donor being the majority of liver transplants that we do in the United States, uh, plummeting here in the living donation, and again, uh, decline and then recover uh, in uh, disease donor liver transplantation across United States. Now, how did we recover so quickly? Um, this next slide um, um, uh, dives into that and addresses it. With the advent of rapid testing and expedited reporting, disease donation and living donor transplant um, liver transplants restarted. However, when we see a donor that's COVID positive, we do not utilize it. Prospective, prospective liver transplant recipients um, or patients waiting on the liver transplant wait list who turn COVID positive uh, liver transplantation is postponed. In terms of induction immunosuppression following liver transplantation, not much has changed. Um, changed. Uh, we use the steroid sparing protocol, ATG induction, followed by tecrolimus monotherapy. Now, three interesting questions uh, that came to us uh, in terms of uh, while we were developing um, this program um, uh, in terms of liver transplantation um, uh, and how to manage the liver transplant recipients. Um, the first one is, what are the rates of COVID-related infection in liver transplant re recipients? And um, what is the morbidity and mortality in liver transplant recipients? The experience is early, so there's a little bit of a variation. How to titrate immunosuppression therapy um, in liver transplant recipients? Some in interesting insights. So, um, Rates of COVID-19 infection. Um, prospective multicenter Spain, uh, ex experience from Spain, 27 liver transplant institutions. Um, uh, uh, there was an increased rate of infection in transplant re recipients. Um, uh, incidents, cumulative incidence rates were uh, uh, estimated. General population 312 or so versus liver transplant recipients or the transplant population. 837. Uh, another interesting study from across uh, Europe that looked at morbidity and mortality, a multi-center cohort study um, from 18 countries reporting uh, um, a liver transplant experience in the setting of COVID-19 uh, infection. 151 liver transplant recipients were compared to a, a cohort of findings, there were no differences in the rate of mild, moderate, and severe liver injury. Liver transplant recipients presented with more GI symptoms. Risk factors such as those found in general population, including age, renal dysfunction, presence of non-liver cancer, had higher impact on outcome than liver transplantation itself. Um, these two bullets are um, um, explained in this diagram on the right and uh, we'll um, 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 uh, discuss this next. Hospital, hospitalization rates as noted here um, for liver transplant recipients were comparable to non-transplant uh, population with an increase in the rate of ICU admissions and ventilator support as noted here in the transplant recipients. Um, in terms of um, overall death, trending lower, but there was no significant difference as noted here. In conclusion, liver transplant is not independently associated with high risk of death in the setting of COVID-19 infection. 
Um, Dr. Renu Mathi Dana Sekran, uh, a superstar uh, in the hepatology section at Stanford, um, uh, reported this experience from the United States, not just from Stanford. Uh, this publication has been accepted uh, by hepatology. Um, um, the group reported um, uh, that all cause mortality rate was 22% in a multi center cohort of liver transplant recipient diagnosed with COVID 19 infection. However, the reported incidence of liver injury in liver transplant recipients compared to match controlled controls was higher, with injury being predominantly hep hepatocellular in pattern. Factors associated with um, liver injury included younger age, metabolic syndrome, and use of or need for vasopressors. Furthermore, liver injury was an independent uh, risk factor for increase in overall mortality. Shifting gears um, uh, and uh, looking at immunosuppression in COVID-19 infection or in the setting of COVID-19 infection, this is all hypothesis. It is hypothesized that COVID-19 infection has two phases. Um, uh, in, tr um, uh, 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 in terms of early viral re replication, late viral clearance uh, due to immune response, triggering deregulation of CD4 T cells and activation of CD8 T cells macrophages and a cytokine storm. The proposed uh, um, uh, uh, mechanism is uh, that immunomodulatory uh, agents can ameliorate this immune response and be potentially protective in liver transplant recipients. So it's recommended that we don't change immunosuppressive therapy uh, in patients um, uh, fall, uh, who are liver transplant recipients, even in the setting of COVID-19 infection. The only retrospective uh, ex uh, experience or recommendations that I come out of these that I've noted previously is decreasing or stopping mycophenolic acid uh, uh, may be beneficial. So summarizing COVID-19 infection and liver transplant recipients, um, uh, management plan, and this is my last slide. Uh, the rate of COVID-19 infection in liver transplant recipients uh, is higher than general population. The rate of death in liver transplant recipients from COVID-19 infection was not increased compared to the match cohort of general population. However, these report uh, the, uh, 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 that the rate of injury in the region uh, consistent when to severe uh, can be associated with mortality. Again, impression should not be stopped. If anything, uh, cofenolic acid uh, can be redeemed or withdrawn, depending on um, uh, patient's uh, previous uh, allograft rejection history. Uh, I would end here. Thank you so much. And uh, please allow me to um, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Taiwo. Uh, um, 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 and uh, will be available for Q&A at the end of this session, uh, at the end of uh, uh, Dr. Taibo's lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ajaz. My name is Ajay Taiwo, and I'm a transplant nephrologist at Stanford. I'm gonna be talking about kidney transplantation in the era of COVID-19. I have no disclosures. Now, at the start of the pandemic, there was a striking reduction in solid organ transplant rates. This figure comes from an article that was published in The Lancet a few months ago. The blue line shows that there was a 50% reduction in solid organ transplant rates in the United States during the early phase of the pandemic. So this chart goes from March 6th until April 10th. And during that time, the red line represents rising COVID-19 infections. So part of the trend may be explained by changes in hospital practices. In order to accommodate for a surge in hospitalizations from the pandemic, many hospitals temporarily held off on elective procedures and some hospitals had to convert operating rooms to ICU rooms. 
While kidney transplantation is quality of life improving and life extending, it is an elective procedure and because there is the option for dialysis, it is not imminently life-saving like other solid organ transplants. Another possible explanation for the trend is changes in transplant center practices. This may have been driven by concerns that transplant patients are at higher risk of severe disease from COVID-19. At the same time, there is some thought that the immune dysregulation that occurs with COVID-19 may be ameliorated by immunosuppression. So kidney transplant recipients may actually be protected to some degree because of immunosuppression. Stanford performed 155 kidney transplants in 2019, and our goal was to at least match, if not exceed this in 2020. Of course, the pandemic um, was an unexpected event for this year, but the right side of this graph shows that we have been on track. Between March of 2020 and April of 2020, we have um, performed a total of 73 kidney transplants, both deceased, living, and also part of multi-organ transplantation. And this is very close to the numbers that we did at the same time period of March 2019 to April 2019. And so we believe we are on track to meeting our goal for 2020. Now, the data consistently shows that older patients and those with comorbid conditions are at higher risk for severe COVID-19 disease. However, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was not clear whether or not kidney transplant recipients were truly at higher risk for disease. Some of the questions we had were, should kidney transplantation continue and should there be restrictions? Are there risk factors that would put patients at unacceptable high risk for kidney transplantation? How do we balance the risk for mortality on dialysis with the risk of post-transplant COVID-19 mortality? And how should we handle living donor transplantation? Finally, do we need to make any changes to our immunosuppression management in the setting of COVID-19? Now, given concerns that immunosuppression may put individuals with transplant at risk for severe COVID-19 disease, it is important to be familiar with the literature on outcomes in kidney transplant recipients. Now, there is a building body of reports, uh, mostly case reports and series in the, in the beginning, but this one multi-center cohort study was based on data from a registry of kidney transplant recipients with COVID-19. This registry was started by an infectious disease team at the University of Washington. And they recently published data on 482 solid, solid organ transplant recipients in over 50 transplant centers. Stanford was one of the contributing centers. Most of the centers were in the United States with a few centers coming from Europe. The median age of individuals in the registry is, 50, registry is 57 and a half years. 66% were kidney or kidney pancreas recipients. 78% required hospital admission. 33.8% required ICU care. 27% required mechanical ventilation. Almost 40% had acute kidney injury with 12% requiring renal replacement therapy. And the 28-day all-cause mortality was 18.7%. This other publication discussed early outcomes of outpatient management of kidney transplant recipients with COVID-19. They had 49 outpatient kidney transplant recipients in their study with known or suspected COVID-19. The study was, took place with individuals from New York City from March 13 to April 6, 2020. And outpatient monitoring was performed through telemedicine or phone calls. The median age of individuals in the study was 49 years, with 73% being male. The median time from transplant was about three and a half years, with 27% having diabetes. Now, only 54% had confirmed COVID-19 disease, with 46% being persons of interest. The pre predominant symptom on presentation was fever, with 80% having fever, 56% having cough, 39% had dyspnea. On the right side of the figure, we see that there were 13 hospitalizations, so 28 patients were able to be managed successfully as outpatients. When you look at the differences between those who, were re who required hospitalizations versus no hospitalization, Hospitalized patients were more likely to have dyspnea with 77% versus 
and they were more likely to have a me higher median baseline creatinine of 2 compared to 1.3 milligrams per deciliter in the outpatients. Now, based on emergent data, Stanford implemented an outpatient monitoring program. In our program at NORSC, once we learn of patients who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, we routinely contact them and monitor their symptoms. Our nurse coordinators are, play an integral role in this process, as well as our transplant nephrologist. We educate patients about alarm symptoms that should prompt them to go to the emergency room. But ultimately, our goal is to be able to manage as many patients at home so that we can refuse exposure to the healthcare system. We have also purchased pulse oximeters, which we have sent to, our, which we send to patients who have confirmed COVID-19. This way, patients are able to monitor their oxygen saturations at home, and we have more objective data since not all patients have dyspnea. We have been routinely holding anti-metabolite until recovery from COVID-19, and we've been able to arrange home laboratory draws if any critical labs are needed during the time of illness. We've transitioned our clinics to telemedicine and we're able to offer these visits as needed to our patients who are being monitored at home. Here are some data we have been collecting from transplant patients who have required COVID-19. We review this data weekly at our meetings and make adjustments based on our patient experience. Now there have been 19 patients thus far who have had COVID-19. 63% of them have been hospitalized. Notably, most of the hospitalizations have actually been at our local community hospitals. And thankfully we have been in good communication with our local providers. And so we've been able to co-manage our kidney transplant patients successfully. 26% of patients have been in the ICU. 26% of patients have been intubated. All patients have been managed with immunosuppression reduction. And depending on the sites where patients are ending up at, our patients have received a variety of therapies, including remdesivir, dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine. We have had one out of the 19 patients pass away from COVID-19 complications, giving us a mortality rate of 5%. So far, we have focused on individuals who have already received kidney transplant. So I'm gonna switch gears to individuals who have stage five chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease and are waiting for kidney transplantation. How have we been approaching our kidney transplant evaluations and deciding whether or not to move forward with kidney transplant listing? And what have we been doing to ensure our living and deceased during our kidney transplants can continue safely? I think one thing that we consider is waste weightless mortality. In this figure from the Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients, um, there's weightless mortality stratified by age. The till blue line represents the oldest age group, which is greater than 65 years old. It's not surprising that older individuals have higher rates of death while waiting on dialysis for transplant. At the same time, we know that older individuals are also at higher risk of severe manifestations of COVID-19 disease. We are being careful to consider um, their transplant candidacy so that we do not lose a window of opportunity for transplanting old, our older patients. Now with regard to risk of donor to recipient transmission, there have really been no cases of donor transmission of COVID-19 reported thus far, but it is possible. In the SARS epidemic of 2003, and also in the present COVID-19 epidemic, autopsy data has shown that the virus is present in organ tissues of the liver and kidney. But the long and short-term implications of this are not quite clear. So from our perspective, donor and recipient screening is important to ensure that transplantation can continue safely. Now, during the time of uncertainty, lack of universal testing, and rapid evolution of the COVID-19 health crisis, some aspects of our program were on hold in the early days of the pandemic. Now, we felt that there might have been an unacceptable risk to living donors who could potentially wait for a safer window of transplantation. And so until we were able to implement universal screening, 
we did put a hold on our living donor transplant program. As of May 2020, we were able to implement universal rapid screening for donors and recipients, and thus we were able to resume our living donor transplant program. Now, with the help of our organ procurement organizations, we were able to continue with our deceased donor transplants during the early phase of the pandemic because they made a decision pretty early on to implement universal do deceased donor screening. With regards to our kidney transplant evaluations during a time of uncertainty and the need to limit um, patient exposure in the hospital setting, um, we did postpone our um, ESRD evaluations, but we were able to resume that in June of 2020. Most aspects are completed virtually by our social worker, our nurse coordinators, our pharmacists, our dietitians, and the patient is brought in for an in-person visit with the transplant nephrologist um, after being screened for negative symptoms. Now to facilitate the transplant process, we have also revised some of our protocols to ensure safety. We carefully evaluate our top of the list kidney transplant candidates in our transplant readiness assessment clinic, also known as our TRAC clinic. In our TRAC clinic, we're able to provide a personalized discussion of risk and benefits for patients so they can be part of the decision-making process. We're also able to weigh the risk of weightless mortality and post-transplant mortality in the setting of COVID-19 infection. Our surgeons have also been carefully considering accepting higher risk deceased donors and recipients. For example, we've been considering the use of high KDPI, which are kidneys that come from older donors with comorbidities and donors of cardiac death. Given the risk of delayed graft function for this group of patients, we've been considering which recipients should be receiving these transplants. We also have been carefully considering our use of PHS increased risk donors, which are our donors who have behaviors that put them at higher risk for infections. And we've been considering recipient factors such as age and comorbidity. With regards to induction immunosuppression, we decided to hold off on using rituximab in highly sensitized patients um, until the pandemic subsides. We will use this when there is new DSA or in the setting of antibody-mediated rejection. Um, once again, our implementation of universal SARS-CoV-2 testing for donors and recipients has enabled us to ensure there is no COVID-19 infection at the time of transplantation. So I would like to end by showing some data from the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. Um, this is Stanford data. It shows that we had a 100% one-year patient survival between January of 2017 and June of 2019. We also have the lowest hazard ratio for one-year patient mortality in the nation, which we are very proud of. And our one-year graph survival is 98.36%, which is better than expected. So in summary, we are very excited to be able to continue our deceased and living donor kidney transplant program. The use of universal SARS-CoV-2 testing um, has enabled us to be able to continue this. We are carefully considering risk factors, evaluating patients at the top of the list in our track clinic, considering the use of our induction immunosuppression and monitoring our patients carefully in the outpatient setting who have developed COVID-19. We have excellent outcomes and we're excited that we can continue to serve our community. Here is our excellent transplant team, our transplant nephrologists, our transplant surgeons, and all of our nurse coordinators, our fellows, our quality consultants. I particularly wanna thank Jaina Patel, Eileen Wang, and Isabella Jacobson for contributing some data for this presentation. With that, I will end. Thank you and I will turn it over to Tammy. Thank you, Dr. Taiwo, for that review. And I want to also extend a heartfelt thank you to my other presenters, Joanna Nelson and H. Azamed. It's been a pleasure to work with all of you on this project. And I would like to take the last two slides to review some of the items that we discussed here today. Namely, 
Stanford continues to have a successful and active liver and kidney transplant program with little, if any, interruption in specialty care. We are utilizing COVID universal COVID-19 testing of all donors and recipients, and we're utilizing this aggressive testing protocol for all admissions and scheduled procedures. Active evaluations are accomplished with both in-person and video platforms for liver and kidney transplant evaluations. In regards to treatment of these patients during the COVID-19 era, we are encouraging early presentation to clinical care for patients with COVID symptoms. And we've noticed that although there is an increased rate of infection, infection in these transplant patients, the rate of death within liver and kidney transplant population is not greater than that of the general population. And the presence of a liver transplant is not associated with an increased mortality. Immunosuppression should not be stopped during COVID-19 infection. However, it is recommended that MMF should be held. There actually may be a protective effect of immunosuppression during the inflammatory viral clearance phase of COVID-19 infection. And lastly, treatment can be divided into three broad categories, antivirals, including remdesivir, immunomodulatory agents, such as steroids, and passive immunity. At this point in time, we will transition to our question and answer portion of the webinar. All right, thank you. And that's the end of the live stream part of the webinar. And so now we're going to transition over to the questions and answers. Um, I think that a couple of questions have been answered already um, within the chat window. Um, if you did raise your hand, uh, I can't actually see your question. So um, if you do have a question, go ahead and put that in the question and answer section. Um, I think a lot of these questions will go to Joanna. So I'm going to go ahead and, and um, maybe, I think there were three of them that were about um, uh, vaccination. Um, and so uh, do you want me to read out those or do you want to go ahead and just tackle those, Joanna? Sure, yeah, if you don't mind reading, that would be great. So. Okay, so Rose asked if, there, if the vaccination under development is going to be a one-time or, or lifetime or seasonal, or, or do we even know? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of things we don't know yet. Um, so I think the thought is that probably um, a vaccine won't um, confer lifelong immunity, but something more like, you know, along the lines of months to years but we really don't know um, about the duration of immunity. So that will be um, something that will be, you know, studied ongoing as uh, the vaccines are being studied. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. There's, I think there's another question um, and it asks questions about the, and I have a question about this to the antibodies. Um, do the antibodies confer any kind of long-term protection um, or are they transient um, and are patients actually being reinfected? Um, how does that play into the development of a vaccine? Yes, good questions. Okay, so if you take people who have had a kind of serology follow-up post-COVID, there is this, um, you know, it has been reported that, you know, initially people are positive and then you get follow-up serologies and they kind of become negative. Now, one thing about that is that, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't immune anymore um, because there's kind of um, also this memory response from the immune system where you might be re-exposed to a pathogen and then the immune um, system kind of kicks in as it should. Um, we don't, um, no, necessarily, you know, there's been, so recently there's been cases about reinfection that have been, um, you know, two that come to mind that have been better documented um, or documented as such that it seems like people are really 
reinfected. Um, but I think that we, um, you know, also need more, a little more time to kind of figure that out. One patient seemed to have quite um, mild to, you know, asymptomatic infection with, with the reinfection. So you might, um, that might suggest that his immune system helped him fight off uh, coronavirus the second time around. The other person was a little less so in that regard. Um, so, you know, I think when you take kind of those two cases in the setting of the vast number of cases we've had in the world, um, I don't think it's necessarily a cause for alarm. I think we just need to learn more about how people with like well-documented reinfections will, um, will present and manifest. And then the second part of the question was about um, what does that mean for vaccine development, right? Yeah, and then I think and another question uh, along that line um, is, do we know if, the, if this particular coronavirus mutates? Right. Um, so it, prob it, it can mutate, um, but it seems to mutate at much, uh, at slower rates compared to something like the flu. So I think, um, you know, whereas you need to get your flu shot every year because of um, it mutates fairly rapidly, that seems to be less the case um, for coronavirus. So I think the thought is that it will um, have less of an impact on vaccine development. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears a little bit into treatment. And again, Joanna, sorry, you are clearly... <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I, I think you probably already answered this a little bit during your talk, but was there a benefit um, to the remdesivir um, and the DEXA? And I'm going to throw in a little bit of a more of a question. Um, it, I'm going to build on that. Do you is there any benefit to starting that treatment earlier? Like, you know, how, how when we're infected with the flu, you know, if you're going to have um, any benefit from the Tamiflu, you need to start it within a certain window of, of infectivity. Do you even know th those questions? Yeah, good question. Okay, so just to review, um, so remdesivir has been shown in hospitalized patients who are requiring some amount of oxygen to decrease the duration of symptoms. And um, dexamethasone uh, was shown in also patients who require oxygen um, to actually improve mortality. So that's kind of the baseline data. Um, now, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, um, you know, there may be somewhat of kind of a, you know, biphasic illness. Um, where you kind of get more of a um, immune mediated illness kind of later into the course. In the remdesivir study, um, it wasn't statistically significant, but it did seem like for those patients with severe disease um, who required mechanical ventilation, there was some benefit to giving it earlier. Um, you know, it is IV. So it's only really available in the hospital. And because there are some, you know, limited supplies, we do have fairly um, regimented kind of criteria for which people will get it. Mostly um, it's if people are requiring uh, any amount of oxygen. Um, but um, once somebody meets that criteria, it seems like theoretically, it's probably better to get that on board earlier. Um, the dexamethasone, I would imagine, I don't think we really have data to say, you know, early versus later, but I think because that immune um, dysregulation can kind of occur into the illness that, um, that it, it, it might not necessarily have as much of a timing issue. It's probably beneficial even if you if somebody's getting that late. That is that is good to know that that because I I feel like now the management is is shifted that we're managing a lot more people at home mm 
Um, so if, if we are doing that before they come to the hospital and their symptoms are worse, is there still that window of benefit from the, the dexamethasone? Um, so I'm, I, I think, I'm not sure how much time we have a few more minutes left. I know I have one question that I still wanna ask Joanna, but I'm gonna um, segue over to an interesting question um, that I'll throw out to both um, Dr. Taiwo and Dr. Ahmed. Um, what are we advising our transplant patients to do during the holidays? Um, well, so, so Dr. Taiwo, when they come to you and say, do I have to wear an N95 everywhere? What, what do you say? Well, so far, no one has asked about Thanksgiving, but I'm sure those questions will be coming soon since it's already the end of September. Um, I think people still absolutely need to social distance based on the numbers. I mean, right now we're already seeing rising cases and it's likely that those, those numbers will get worse in the fall and winter months. And so large gatherings for holidays are still discouraged. I think it's okay to have gatherings with your clusters in your household, but anything outside of that, I think should be discouraged and also just taking all the precautions, the, the, the mask wearing, hand hygiene, um, social distancing as much as possible. But I would still very strongly discourage gatherings over the holidays. Thank you. I, and that's that's a tough one. It's a really tough one for, for people to hear than when they've been cooped up for so long. Um, Dr. Ahmed, what do you say if um, a patient says, you know, I haven't seen my relatives in Boston since, um, you know, last Thanksgiving, um, you know, are you, are you, you know, telling them not to travel at all or giving them more specific recommendations if they do need to travel? So I agree with everything Dr. Taiwo said, and I introduce my patients to Zoom um, when they want to travel. And I've, I've asked all of them not to travel and, um, and you know, that's just my bias maybe. And in terms of N95, uh, I tell them if you can wear it all day, sure. But uh, it's, you know, we, you, we use it during our endoscopy uh, time and it's really hard to keep it on. Uh, and uh, so um, my older patients, some of them uh, uh, where their families uh, have recommended or physicians in the families have recommended it, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm usually okay with it. And, uh, but, you know, social distancing and uh, not being in a crowded space, as like Dr. Tai was said, those are really the key things. And uh, especially the elderly transplant recipients, because if they get sick, they have a much higher risk of not doing well. So those are the patients, uh, when we do our follow-ups, we really go over things with them. And and luckily, most of them are very careful. Thank you. I think that's super um, helpful and insightful. And you know, it, there isn't always one right or wrong answer, but it's really just trying to provide the patient with as much information as we have at the time. Um, uh, I think there was one other question that I wanted to address, and now I've lost it. Um, sorry about that. Oh, um, is there any, it was an ID question. Um, it was there any role of, um, prophylaxis, um, uh, I'm in this Favi. Thank you. In normal people to stop COVID or in mild COVID patients to reduce the symptoms. Yeah, so that's actually a question that is being studied now. Um, it's actually one of the outpatient trials that we're participating in, looking at giving people with mild um, COVID favipiravir to see if it prevents progression to more severe illness. So um, I think more data will be coming there. Otherwise, we don't have any um, definitive, or there's no data to suggest um, so far that there's any agents that are beneficial for prophylaxis. The only thing um, otherwise that I'm aware of as having been studied somewhat rigorously was hydroxychloroquine in that regard. 
Yeah, and I guess I have a stupid question um, because I, as far as I know, we're not using that in the US, although a lot of the studies do, um, I, and they're probably older studies at the beginning because there was really no other treatment. Um, do, you, do you know if Europe's still using um, hydroxychloroquine in their patients? I think now, no. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, initial kind of like theoretical excitement because it does have some kind of anti-infective properties, but um, you know, larger studies have shown that it's not helpful and some show potentially harm. So I think it's fallen out of favor. Um, all right. Um, I think there was one other um, question. I think there was another question about mutation and I think you already had addressed that. I'll just kind of uh, restate it that as far as um, Dr. Nelson noted, it, it can mutate but it not um, the, the rate that we see with the flu. Um, so it's not going to be as challenging to make a virus, um, Joanna, is that? Right, yeah, I, I mean, um, it can mutate. It seems less frequent than the flu exactly. So therefore it should have less of an impact on the vaccine as far as I understand. Okay, and then I was gonna just ask one little controversial question about, um, uh, convalescent plasma, um, because I do know that, you know, it has been used and, and in fact, I think it was in, used in one of our post-transplant patients um, who, who had mild COVID, however, was hospitalized with hypoxemia um, and, and ultimately did very well. Um, but what, what is kind of your opinion and Stanford's stance on this? Great question. I think that, um, there isn't necessarily randomized controlled trials um, report, you know, published looking at this. So our data is um, not super strong. Um, there was one study out of China um, which showed no benefit, um, but actually it was stopped early because they were having a decrease in cases. So it wasn't powered very well. So it's hard to know what to make of that. The other thing about that study is people got it very late into the disease, like a month after um, symptom onset. Um, and then there was a more recent study out of the Mayo Clinic looking at patients who got kind of high titer um, convalescent plasma versus lower titer. And it seemed like the higher titer people did better. Um, but again, that's kind of um, not a randomized trial. Um, so, um, you know, not kind of our strongest level of data. Um, I think where we have um, kind of landed in with kind of interpreting this data is um, we, we definitely don't give it to everybody. Um, there is, you know, a theoretical benefit in the transplant population, somebody that's immunocompromised and isn't going to potentially be able to mount um, their own immune response against the virus. So I would say we have had um, a bit of a lower threshold to use it for transplant patients based on kind of not great data. Um, but we do, um, you know, there can be side effects such as, um, you know, transfusion associated lung injury or fluid overload. So if somebody, um, you know, is already on the overloaded side or seems like they won't be able to handle fluid, um, that might be a setting where we would not use it, um, you know, because the data isn't super strong. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there was one last question because I don't want to leave any of the questions un, um, unaddressed, but I, I don't honestly know if we can answer that question. It's about the utility of remdesivir. And I feel like poor remdesivir was like, you know, when, when we were all just struggling and people are dying and, and we, can't, we have nothing else to offer them in the ICU, you know, we're, we're offering them this medication and finding just maybe there was just a teeny bit of, of a response. And is that really a reliable data? And, and kind of where do we go from here? I, I mean, I know all of us were, were kind of questioning that data and how reliable and how important that is. Um, I don't know if you can even kind of address that or what you see the future, you know, um, where the future studies going um, with, with other drugs. That was a big question, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's a good question and I think it's a very valid point. 
um, you know, it shortened duration by a few days. Um, and in the studies, there really wasn't a more mortality benefit. Um, so it's certainly not like the answer to COVID. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm sure over time, more and more things are being studied, more data is going to come out. Um, so out of the things so far, it, it, I feel like probably does show some benefit, but um, I don't think it's kind of the be all end all of COVID treatment. Um, you know, we, we may hopefully be able to find more things that have an impact on mortality, um, which is, you know, probably the most important endpoint. Right. Um, and then I think I just wanted to ask one last question um, of, of Dr. Taiwo. Um, I, I know that in, in the liver transplant um, data set, which again is limited, um, that the, the patients who were infected didn't, um, didn't particularly have an increased rate of mortality in compared to the general population. But we did see that um, when looking at the data, those patients that did have acute liver injury actually did do worse. Um, have a have a poor outcome. So, Dr. Taiwo, have you seen that in any of the data? Um, because, I, and again, kind of maybe I'm making the question too big. But of when we look at the general population, the people who don't do well are the people who have renal insufficiency. So, how does that translate in your um, kidney transplant population? Um, kind of two. Questions. Yeah. So that's a very good question. I think one of the studies that I looked at was obviously hospitalized patient had more were at higher risk of developing acute kidney injury or renal insufficiency than outpatients. Um, but the mortality data, I actually am not sure if the mortality has been higher um, in patients who ended up with acute kidney injury or renal replacement therapy. So that's one that I'd actually have to take a look at. But that's a very good question. And do you, do you tell your patients, so everybody, everybody avoids the hospital, do you tell your patients that, you know, if they have symptoms, do you tell them to come to the hospital? Do you tell them to come to the hospital early? Tell us a little bit more about your protocol. I, I was interested in that. Yeah, so we, you know, we're very connected with our patients, and so it's very easy for them to access us with any little question that they have, and our transplant coordinators are fantastic. So we're actually able to triage a lot of our patient complaints um, in the outpatient setting. And then we monitor our outpatients very closely. So if there are any concerning symptoms that they're having, we can actually advise them when to come into the hospital. For, for those who are really concerned, because we've had people who are due for routine labs or just routine visits who are just really worried about coming to the hospital. I mean, we provide a lot of reassurance. I mean, telemedicine is one visit that we offer for those who are relatively low risk but also assuring them that hospital transmission overall is pretty low. And so if they need to come into a hospitalized setting, we are taking every precaution to make sure that they're safe. Okay, and Ajaz, just, you know, anything else to comment on um, about your, your patients and your patient population um, that you wanted to share? No, no, you know, agree with uh, Dr. Taiwo. And um, just on the pre-transplant side, uh, you know, we used to have a clinic where we would see all sick patients and then admit the um, ones that uh, were much sicker. And now um, our clinic has changed to a telehealth clinic versus, uh, you know, where the patient meets the admission criteria, we bring them in. So um, uh, we've been able to perform expedited liver transplant evaluations uh, and list patients quickly. And uh, our care has not been impacted. Obviously post uh, transplant, fresh post transplants, we see with extreme precautions and we're slowly phasing in in-person clinics as you're doing, Tammy. And, um, and, um, and um, that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I feel like some of our post-transplant patients, um, they stay longer in the hospital. Um, and that'd be some kind of interesting data to look at um, long term. Um, but it's because we don't want to discharge them to a rehab facility. Or, you know, if they're not able to go home, you know, we want to try to keep them in a more protected and more controlled setting for that we're in control of for a little bit longer. Um, 
But so I, I'm going to go ahead and close everything down. Thank you, everyone, uh, for participating. Uh, this was a lot of fun um, getting to know all my participants even more. Um, and thank you all, you, the participants, for, um, for logging on. If you have any questions, I think you can email us. Um, and have a good night. Thank you.